Uh, yeah, so funnily enough, um, I still work at Optiver, as Bruce mentioned, um, as head of academic partnerships. I live in Gympie in Queensland, which is a really weird place to live. You're like, why are you living there? Um, well, I just do. And I just do a lot of my work remotely from there. So I flew in this morning. This thing is killing me. Flew in this morning. Uh, success. Okay, there we go. Uh, slides. Yeah. Flew in this morning, did a talk at Optiva, come here to do a talk about prime numbers. Um, yeah, live in the middle of nowhere. That's pretty much me. So really excited to come and talk to everybody about prime numbers. Um, as Bruce mentioned, it was my PhD topic and I still research in prime numbers. So I'm a lot slower at doing it, but every couple of years uh, I'll have a paper come out, something new and exciting and prime number. -y. Uh Yeah. So called this talk primes and options, um, but I'm not going to talk about you know the options you trade. I'll talk more about you know a little bit of maybe about the options that you have out there being a, a mathematician, and I'll also talk about what sort of stuff you can do out there. Um, you know, if you want to research prime numbers, so there's lots of stuff around. Um, when I first wanted to get into primes back in sort of 2010, 2011, there wasn't really anywhere to do it. Um, and then uh, a mathematician called uh, Tim Trudgeon moved to ANU and I went into my PhD at ANU and he's now at UNSW Canberra. Um, has anyone heard of Tim? Tim Trudgeon? Yeah, maybe a couple of people. So he has a number theory team at UNSW Canberra. Um, it's him, someone else, and he has like seven PhD students. So there's like a really quite a, he's got a, quite a big team of PhD students. He's, um, yeah, he's a fantastic supervisor. So if anyone wants to do a number theory PhD, um, they can go and talk to him. Um, alternatively, you can also come and talk to me now because I recently signed on at University of Queensland um, as an adjunct, uh, in an adjunct position. So I can supervise research projects if anyone fancies to move up to God's country. Uh, okay, let me just get through this. Introduction slide. So a bit about myself. We sort of already done this. I'm just going to fly through it. Um, yeah. So I'm part time at Optiva doing university engagement, and then in my spare time, I do a bit of number theory. Um, I have this blog called Maths Feed that some of you know about and have even contributed to, um, or at least would have if I um, could get my act together. I've got three tiny children. Uh, they take up a lot of my time, and I've also started looking at some quantitative biology stuff. So um, in terms of mathematics, I really like maths because you can just, you can do prime numbers for a bit. You can go trade options for a bit. You can uh, look at, you know, genetics and genes and that sort of thing for a bit. Like maths gives you this amazing position to just then go and look at all these different interesting things with this incredible mathematical lens. So you can go and be, um, you know, a better biologist and a lot of other biologists are better. Um, so you can do better in finance and people who are trained up in finance, like maths is incredibly powerful that way. Um, so today we talk a bit about primes. Uh, I'll try and give, uh, I'll talk a bit about my PhD research and I'll, I'll try and give the flavor of the area of number theory that I was in. So I was in an area called analytic number theory and um, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Prime numbers are like discrete objects, right? So like, your primes, you've got your list, you've got two, three, five, seven, 11. There's this discrete countable set. Um, but analytic number theory is the process of studying that discrete set using, you know, calculus and analysis and continuous and differentiable functions. So it's really weird. It's like this place where, you know, um, sort of uh, functions and continuous things meet like discrete structures. It's very, um, very, very fascinating. So I'll just introduce the prime numbers and why I originally sort of became attracted to them. Um, don't tell my wife, she doesn't know. Uh, but uh, one thing that a lot of you know is that primes are like the building blocks of arithmetic, uh, all the atoms, if you like. So if you take a number like 60, you can break it down into just a bunch of primes being multiplied together. And that's usually why we say, no one, you're not allowed to be a prime because then I could just write, you know, times one, times one, times one, as many times as I like. And I break the uniqueness, you know? 
this decomposition is unique because I to build 60, I always need two twos, a three and a five, and I mush them together and I get 60. So 60 has like, um, it's uniquely made up of those atoms. And if you could, if one were a prime atom as well, well, your uniqueness is gone. Uh, so again, 33, that molecule would be made up of a three and an 11 and 17, well, that's just an atom, it's just a prime already. Um, so yeah, I, I sort of, you know, I saw this idea, okay, you can think of numbers as being made up of these, you know, these prime atoms. And uh, what was really nice was just like in chemistry, um, when you take, you know, you take a molecule, you look at what it's made up of, and its composition tells you things like it's boiling point or um, what else would a chemist want to know? You can't help me out here. It's char, I don't know. I hate chemistry, so I don't know why this actually drew me into number theory. Um, but uh, it turns out that you can take a number and look at its molecular structure, and that gives you information about that number. And I thought this was fascinating. So I'll give you an example with this number here, 169 million. 954,785, that's its molecular formula. It turns out when you look at those prime atoms and you specifically look at, you break, you look at the ones that are congruent to one mod four. Okay, so five and 13 are one more than a multiple of four. Whereas three, seven and 11, the ones I've shaded in blue, they're one less than a multiple of four. And it turns out when you look at the molecular structure of a number, and you look at specifically the primes that are one less than a multiple of four, if they have even powers, then it turns out that that number can be expressed as a square plus a square. So in this case, when you look at the molecular formula of that number, um, the structure of it specifically, if these primes have even powers, which they do, then that original number can be deconstructed as a square plus a square. And it's an if and only if as well, I believe. So this goes back to this guy, Euler, um, 1749. And I just thought that's fascinating. So, you know, the, the primes are, they have, the, they have a place, they're very important. The way you build a number out of primes, um, you, you can, you're sort of getting certain properties. So that's just sort of one example, um, but, but there are um, plenty of others. Okay. Um, we should prove that there's infinitely many primes. Is that everyone, has anyone seen a proof of this before? Yep, yep. And it's usually the one, like Euclid's one from like, you know, 2,300 years ago. Uh, we'll do something a little bit different. Here's a proof that I quite like, similar in nature, I suppose, but it was only published maybe 30 years ago. Very simple and short, and very nice. Um, so let's prove that there are infinitely many primes. Well, we'll just use this fact that any two consecutive numbers five and six or 13 and 14, uh, they have no prime factors in common. I guess that makes sense, right? Like if you think about um, multiples of two, you start at two and you're always jumping two to get to the next one. Uh, same with multiples of three, you start at three, you're always jumping three to get to the next one, right? Three, six, nine. So there's no way like for two numbers to be right next to each other and have a prime factor in common. That's impossible, right? Because you're always jumping. You're always jumping over at least the next number. So hopefully everybody accepts this. That's all we really need. What we're gonna do is I'm just gonna make a sequence of numbers, okay? So that'll be, a, you know, I'll call this A1 and A2, A3, A4, and so on. And it turns out that the nth element in my sequence will be divisible by at least n different primes. Um, and then from there, it's pretty much straightforward. It's pretty straightforward to just say, well, we can just take n as large as we want, and we'll get a number that's divisible by as many primes as different primes as we want. So there must be infinitely many different primes. So I'm going to show you how, how we do this. Let's just start with the number three. So three is divisible by one prime number. This will be the starting element of my sequence. I come up with the number, the first thing in my sequence, and it's divisible by one prime number. Well, to make another number, um, I know from my stat that any two consecutive numbers have no prime factors in common. So the next number up from three, four, um, yeah, that's right. Four has to be divisible by some new prime factor that I haven't already captured here. So then if I take three and I multiply by four, I get a number that has to be divisible by at least two prime numbers. We 
When O3 is divisible by a prime number, it is a prime. And then four is consecutive to it, it's the next one up, it must be divisible by some new prime factor. There's no way it could be the one that we've already counted. So then we get, we've got 12, which is the second element in my sequence. That's divisible by at least two prime factors. You don't just do the same thing, right? I know that 12 is divisible by at least two different prime factors. So the number up from it, 13, must contain a new prime factor, something that I haven't seen before. So I'm just going to do 12 times 13. And I know I've got at least two prime factors here. And I'm going to get a new one here. So I'll get a new number, 156, and that'll be divisible by at least three prime numbers. So I just take an element in this sequence and I multiply it by itself plus one to generate another number. And so all I'm really doing here is creating a sequence of numbers where the nth one is divisible by at least n different prime numbers. Um, and this is not a very formal proof, but it wouldn't take anyone in this room long to write, to write one up. Okay, so it's a nice simple construction of a number that's divisible by at least n different prime numbers. Okay, so prime's gone forever. Everyone was probably already happy with that. There they are. And I guess the question is, what else can we say about this sequence, right? I have a, how old is she? <laughs> she's almost, she's almost six, that's why I was wondering. So I have a five-year-old daughter. Um, and we talk a lot about evens and odds and primes and that sort of thing. So I can explain this to her. I can say, these are the prime numbers. And she's like, yep, understand, good. Um, and she calls them, the, we call them the, 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 the non-share, the not sharing numbers. So the numbers you can't share, you can't share them. You can't divide them by a group unless that group is as big as the number of things you've got. Um, but I can explain it to her, but it's very hard, right? Mathematicians have spent so long trying to understand the prime numbers. Um, and that's what I think is so fascinating. They're very simple to define, really, really hard to study. Um, and so one of the points of today's talk is to talk about one of the main weapons we use to study the prime numbers, our main analytic weapon. Uh, I'll get there soon, but I sort of felt like I should include um, this result. In there. So I suppose I could hide this bar at the top. I'm sure there's a way to do it. Uh, no, you can just live there. And you just so you know, it's only concealing ones. So um, there's this. So you, you all know about like the harmonic series. That's if you do like one plus a half plus a third plus a quarter plus a fifth, nothing goes off to infinity. It turns out that the reciprocals of the primes, if you sum them up, so one over two plus one over three plus one over five and so on, that goes off to infinity as well. Has anyone seen a proof of this? Yeah. Is that like the Mobius functions and whatnot? Okay, this will, have no, this will have no Mobius functions. This is what I'll give is probably a proof. The reason I'm gonna give a proof is there's an identity that ties in uh, an inequality rather that ties in a little bit later. Um, and I just think it's, I think it's nice to see a, a proof like this, or rather to show you a little bit of the flavor of how you can use estimates and stuff from calculus to study prime numbers. Um, so I'm gonna prove that the sum of the reciprocals of the primes gets arbitrarily large. Now, um, with the harmonic series, if you do one plus a half plus a third, all the way up to one over X or something, that's roughly gonna be about log X. So that's how fast that sum grows, or the partial sums will grow. Uh, for the primes, it's like log, log of X. Um, there's a lot of, there's this joke, what do you, you know, what sound does a drowning number theorist make? Log, 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 log. Because in number theory, there's lots of logs of logs. Okay, so it's very common to see like four nested logs in like a number theory paper. Um, but who would drown a number theorist? That's what I ask you. So uh, let's prove this thing. So um, it starts off with this little inequality. Okay. We first observe that. I love when people are like, we just observe, it's just there, we just observe it. I mean, someone obviously has to come up with it. Uh, so on the left-hand side, I'm just doing like one plus a half plus a third plus a quarter plus a fifth and so on. I've sort of got the harmonic series back up there on the left. And it turns out that this sum over the natural numbers, the, reciprocal, the sum of the reciprocal of the natural numbers, it's going to be less than this product over primes p. So whenever you see a p in the talk, it's going to be a prime. And it turns out 
that. That is less than that. And you might think, well, how? Um, I guess let's have a look at what that product actually is. So I'm just going to write it out in a bit more longhand. So it's a product. So for every prime, I'm going to have that thing. And I'm going to multiply these product. I'm going to multiply them all together. So for the first prime two, I'll have this set of brackets. For the next prime three, I'll have this set. For the next prime five, I'll have that, that set. And then the reason that that product is bigger than that sum is when I actually expand out that product, I can recover, because numbers are made up of the primes, when I expand out that product, I can recover all the stuff on the left, at least. So for example, if there's like, um, there'll be like, you know, a one on 18 on the left-hand side. And when I multiply all this out, I'm gonna get like a one on, uh, one on two times one on three squared, um, times one, times one, and so on. But when I do the expansion, I expand it out term by term, you're going to get, you're going to recover all of the numbers. And some of them you're going to recover, um, well, you recover, uh, because your prime's going up to X, you're going to recover things that are bigger than X as well. Whereas, so the right-hand side is going to be strictly greater. Does, does that sort of make sense? Yep. So you do that expansion and you get all the stuff on the left, just through this multiplying out and plus some extra stuff. So the right-hand side is going to be bigger. So if you're sort of happy with that, um, then we can go to the next step. The next step is just a little bit of, this is a little bit of algebra we do now. I'm just going to rewrite it. And I'm just going to take out this common factor of one over P and open up another set of brackets like that. So I've just factored out one over P there. And then that inner set of brackets, one, plus one on P, plus one on P squared, plus so on, so on, so on. Um, that's just, I can just rewrite that as like our, um, that's just like a geometric series, right? One plus X plus X squared plus X cubed and so on. It should just be like one over one minus X. Um, so I do that. So I'm just doing a little bit of massaging at the moment. Um, and then I just can multiply these two fractions together. One times one is one, P times one take one on P. Well, P times one is P, P times one on P is one. So again, I'm just doing this um, simpler simplification. So a little, just a little bit of algebra so far. All equalities from that first part. So, you know, that is exactly equal to that. Uh, okay, and so we'll see in a second um, why I'm doing this. Matt, so we're, you're, you know, you've all, a lot of you study maths, so you're used to maths being backwards. You're used to someone, you know, getting all the details in order and then presenting it like it's beautiful. We know, well, hopefully, you know, maths doesn't really work like that um, a lot of the time, unless you're Terence Tao. Uh, yep. And uh, sorry, folks, I am not him. So uh, we've got this. And then um, what we can do here is... We're trying to recover a sum of one on P. What, am I, what I want to do is I want to get like a sum of one on P on the right-hand side, because then I want to show that it's bigger than this thing. And that thing goes to infinity, so my sum of one over P has to go to infinity as well. That's what I'm really trying to do. Just trying to make a sum of one on P appear on the right-hand side. I'm sort of getting there. Um, but we just use this fact, right? Like I've got this, um, we know, well, the nice thing is I've got a product, I want to get a sum, Exponentials can help us do that, right? Product of exponentials, you know, e to the a times e to the b will be e to the a plus b. So I sort of want to convert what I have on the right to exponentials. So um, because e to the x is one plus x plus x squared on two factorial plus so on, um, one plus x, just those first two terms have to be less than e to the x. So if one plus x is less than e to the x, then one plus Blah, it's going to be less than e to the blah. I'm just going to do that. I'll write it as x of 1 over p minus 1. And now the product of e to the blah, right, I can move the product. I can change the product to a sum. A lot of you will be used to this idea, logs and exponentials, right? You're just communicating between sum land and product land. But all I've done here is I've just use e to the a times e to the b is e to the a plus b, all right? I've got a lot of e's being multiplied together here, and I can just 
bring the E out and put everything in the power as a sum. This is good. I reckon this is good enough, right? I'm trying to prove that the sum of one over P diverges. What do I have? The sum over one on P minus one. I mean, they're pretty much the same thing, right? The denominator is going to be slightly off. Yeah, it's good enough. I mean, A, A minus or maybe, maybe B plus. Um, if you wanted to do it, because at this point, the left-hand side goes to infinity as X gets really large. So the right-hand side, which is um, bounded below by the left-hand side, must also go to infinity. And this is E of the sampling, so this must go to infinity. So you think we're pretty much done. Um, honestly, you could just do like a little bit of an extra step to like convert that into like this. You get, you get, but honestly, it's, it's, it's good enough. It, it works. It works. Um, any questions about that proof? So it's kind of like the way you get like a blog blog, like from that one. Exactly. Yep. So um, if we just do this again, so if you just take the logs of both sides, right? Yeah, you get a log of that thing which grows as log x, and you'll just get the log will cancel that, and you'll just get the sum. So you pretty much get a lower bound for this, which is going to be of the form um, log log x. Um, and then you can you can also do so. There's a couple of very of relatively recent last thirty years papers on because um, yeah uh, to prove that asymptotic that the sum of one on p is log log x um, usually you can use an analytic method but if you just do it this way you have got your lower bound here you can get an upper bound um, that differs by constant you can pretty much show that asymptotically log log x is correct so yeah this is half half of that proof. Um, but there, yeah, there are some fairly recent, fairly recent proofs of, of this sort of thing that just use that just use this as half of it. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about. So I'm going to motivate our analytic stuff with this problem. Is there a prime between n squared and n plus one squared for all n greater than or equal to one? So this is called Legendre's conjecture. Is there at least one prime between any two consecutive squares? So you're like, okay, here are my square numbers, one, four, nine, 16, 25. And uh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, if I look between them, I can find primes between any two of them. There's never a, a gap where there's no primes. So yeah, Legendre's conjecture must be true. Uh, talk finished, we can all go home. Uh, so,
long period of time. Um, but it's like one of those things from which like one one step away. Um, yeah. So what I did during my PhD, one of the problems I worked on was a similar problem, problem between cubes. Can't do squares, why not try cubes? Um, this was something that had already been worked on like a hundred years prior. Uh, and someone, a uh, mathematician by the name of Ingram, ah, thank you for his legend, a mathematician by the name of Ingham has shown that there is a prime between consecutive cubes, but if only had managed to prove it for all the cubes, he just proved it for like from some point. And he didn't really bother saying what that point was. He just did the math. So, you know, kept everything using like big O notation. And um, basically, it was enough to be like, yeah, it definitely, it definitely works. It's definitely true. Uh, who, who cares? Um, so, yeah, catch up. I'm going to bring in and one cube. So, I looked at this problem uh, with the gaps of bigger. And I managed to prove, I managed to take England's work from 100 years earlier. And do all the calculations that he couldn't be bothered doing, um, and prove that there's a prime between n cubes and one cube if n is a whole or sort of thing. So this is um, apparently for a PhD. So I'm going to argue. Um, I, I did. I worked on some other problems as well. They're very related to the methods used to prove. Now, um, yeah. So there's no way we can compute up to that number. So really, we just need to sort of try and bring that number down. So some researchers at UNSW Canberra have worked on this since, but they haven't, managed, they haven't really done. Um, they've improved it, um, but not by the amount we really need. If we can get this down to about 10 to the 17, I reckon we're in business. We can finish it off with a, with a computer. All right, I'm gonna talk about how you prove the result. Yeah. Um, there are no counter examples. It's just assumed that it's true for all of them. Like it probably is just true for all cubes. I would I would bet everything I have. Have you checked 10 to the bottle of my <laughs> ah yeah? No. Well, I mean that's the thing, right? So so using these analytic methods, we I can prove that theorem from that number upwards. And I'm pretty sure it's true for, from like one up to that number, but I can't prove that. We can compute a small amount of that range, then there's a massive gap from 10 to the 17 up to 10 to the bazillion. Um, so I don't think there will be any counterexamples. I think it's true, but obviously it's not good enough for mathematics, right? So um still waiting on. I went in this room possibly to uh, sort out the remaining bunch. Uh, so, I'm going to talk a bit about how we study prime numbers. We've got this thing called the, well, what is it? The staircase um, steps up at prime numbers. Uh, I guess you could put it in your house if you want to, but it would be a weird staircase. So, this is called the prime counting function. We write it as like pi of x. And it just counts the number of primes up to and including x. So, um, which is the step function that sets up one at every prime number. So, like pi of seven, pi of seven is just the number of primes less than or equal to seven. Two, three, five, seven, four of them. That's why it's seven it steps up and it's now equal to four until you hit the next prime at eleven, where it has to step up again. So, this is the prime counting function. Um, so, it turns out that if you zoom out, right? You just zoom out and you make this rather than looking from one to 11, you look. It's just smooth, smooth there. And your eye cannot resolve.
by the subdomain means version. So this is exactly what the prime number theorem is. In, in those terms, I mean, it pretty much is that. The prime number theorem is the statement that when you zoom out on this thing, it's pretty much, you can also plot x over log of x, and you wouldn't see any difference. You wouldn't be able to resolve any difference between the numbers. Uh, mathematically, of course. So we, we have this little squiggle, right? Pi of x squiggle x over ln of x. And that means we say they're asymptotically equivalent. And it basically means if I just look at the quotient of those two things, and take the limit as x goes to infinity, it's equal to one. Which means that if I approximate pi of x by x over natural log of x, the percentage error between those in that approximation goes to zero. And your I cannot resolve down as low as pi. So this is the prime number theorem. The prime number theorem is the statement that pi of x is asymptotically equivalent to x over log of x. And literally means you can do that and it looks like that's the entire thing. Okay, so we've got this prime staircase. Prime counting function. We're actually studying this other sort of funkier staircase. It makes things a lot easier. So I haven't proven the prime number theorem. I will show you how it's proven. And it's also starting to how you prove stuff about one between cubes and other things. So we look at this funkier staircase. This just doesn't step up at the prime, it also steps up at numbers which are a power of the prime. So um, we call it Chevy Chevy Sky function. It doesn't just jump up at two, it'll jump up at the power of two as well. And it'll, it'll jump up by the same amount, so log two, at two and all the power of two. It'll jump up by log three at three, and also jump up by log three at nine. So at any power of three, it jumps up at log three. At any power of five, it jumps up by log five, right? It's the sum of log p to every number p to the power of one. Less than or equal to x. So that's this Chebyshev side function. So why do we look at this? Well, we'll see very, very shortly. Uh, it really, it really, the test me actually. Uh, this is just because I do this all the time. It's building. It's about building suspense. Everyone is dying by that. Sorry. Um, gosh. Um, so I'm going to duplicate that, let it reload, and then see how we go in the meantime. Sort of just look at it here while the other one's loading. So, um, so we have a prime number theorem for our prime staircase. It's actually equivalent to a different form. So now that we've got our funky log staircase that jumps up at primes and prime powers, it turns out that if you zoom out on that second staircase, the log one, it looks exactly like the straight line y with x. And that's another way of expressing the prime number theorem. Okay, so it means the same thing as before. It means the limit of x goes to infinity of psi of x over x is equal to one. Um, and you can, as an exercise, if you want to prove that this form is the same as the other form, um, but you might need to Google like partial summation before you do that. Okay. Will you play ball? This is my life now. Hmm. I might play ball. Okay, we're in business again. Don't press button. 
faster than two times the speed. All right. So let's have a look at how a lot of analytic number theory is built, or an idea that a lot of this prime number stuff is built. Has anyone here ever done any, any like complex analysis, like the complex numbers, conversion tables, that sort of thing? If so, cool. If not, don't worry. Um, there's this formula, it's called Perron's formula. It's really easy. That would be, let's say that you have some sum that you want to study. Now, this could be, um, you know, this sum could be a sum of, uh, this could be the prime staircase, if you like, or it could be that log, that other prime staircase on the logs that we're looking at now. Um, it could just be any old sum that you want to study. And let's say that you always also have like this Dirichlet series, it's called. It's a function, uh, the function of Z. A the sum of a n over n to the z. This thing is called the Dirichlet series. So often in mathematics we study the Dirichlet series, um, and it turns out what we're going to see is that if you've got like a sequence that you want to study, so it could be the sum of log p, right, and it's or the sum of log n, but it's like got an indicator attached to it, so you only register that log when n is prime um, or the prime power. If you've got a Dirichlet theory, so a function that look has this form where the numerators are that sequence you want to study, it turns out that you can use some complex analysis to pull information out of it. So what do we do to do that? Well, we take the Dirichlet series, we do some complex analysis stuck to it, we do a contour integral over like an infinite vertical line, a bit of a scaling factor in there. And if we do that, we can get information about our original sum, uh, about the sequence we want to study. So this is really a key idea. Going from a Dirichlet series, which is usually like some crazy analytic function, this property about the sum of the sequence itself, or the partial sum of the sequence. This is a really powerful idea. If you've done complex analysis, the proof of this would maybe take you five minutes to understand. It's quite, um, it's quite simple. Okay, so in this case, we're looking at that funky log staircase. This is the function we're using. A subscript n is log p if n is prime power, but zero otherwise. So the thing on the left is going to be that if I choose a n to be that, the thing on the left is going to be psi x, my funky staircase. Uh, but I just need the Dirichlet series. I need to come up with the right Dirichlet series. Um, so what do I need? Will look like that, I suppose. So it's like, well, this seems like I'm just making the problem harder. The reason I'm not, and the reason that we're studying this crazy staircase is that this Dirichlet series actually comes up really naturally when you start looking at the Riemann zero. Don't know why it's hiccuping like that, but that's all right. Leave it alone. So there's this thing called the Riemann zeta function. It's the sum of one over n to the s. As, um, it's a function of s, right? And n gets summed from one up to infinity. So for example, like zeta of two is just the sum of one and n squared over all n. So zeta of two we know is pi squared over six. Um, zeta of three, we, who knows? We know it's irrational. Um, we've known that for about 43 years, but uh, no one's ever written down a nice little formula for it. Um, it turns out, right, if you take your Riemann zeta function, now this thing on the left, it doesn't, if I put like S equals one in, for example, I'm just going to get the harmonic series. I'm going to get this infinite thing. It makes no sense. In fact, that's true. I put in anything less than one. If I put in like zero and a half. That should all go down there. But what we do in complex analysis is we take this function and we look at the part of it where it makes sense. So this function makes sense if the real part of S is greater than one, which we do. And then we do something called analytic continuation, and we extend that function into something that does make sense. So the Riemann zeta function is, yes, this thing, when the real part of S is greater than one, so when that thing actually converges to a, to a number, and then we use analytic continuation to extend it to almost the entire complex plane um, in a way that will give us sensible numbers everywhere, Except it still has its pole at S equals one. Can't get rid of that. Uh, it turns out that this zeta of S, if you look at this thing, the negative of the derivative over itself, 
you get exactly the Jewish life series we need. Okay, why did we talk about the connection between the Raymond Zeta function and the primes? Well, because if you take the Raymond Zeta function and you come up with that funky thing on the right, and it looks crazy, but it's not really, um, you express the Zeta function in this prime product form. Not too hard to do. I understood that proof we did before, where I said that the sum of one and n was less than that product over the primes. As you take x to infinity, sort of, you'll be able to show you'll roughly get equality. And that's where that's why that and that thing are the same. There's a bit of a connection there. But yeah, if you just rewrite zero and s in this product way, which is a homework exercise for everyone here, um, and then take logs and differentiate, you'll get that. Right, you know, when you differentiate log of like a function, you get the derivative of a function over the function itself. That's what you've got here the derivative of a function over a function itself. So you've taken log of that and you've differentiated. And the thing that pops up is exactly as exact, is exactly the virtual series that we need. Okay, so now we can take Prime's formula. We want to get psi of x, our funky logging prime staircase on the left, and we want this. Um, we can use that to replace it as well. I've done the contour integration for everyone here, so you're welcome. Right, someone already did for me. But if you do that, right, if you carry out the, again, this is a bit of complex analysis. It's nothing too crazy when you actually do it. But what do you get? Well, you get X, and you get this crazy stuff here, which we've talked more about. And then you get stuff here, and this small, when I say small stuff, I mean small, like it's bigger of one. It's like a constant, um, basically, and a term that vanishes as x goes to infinity. So small stuff we really cannot worry about. Psi of x is equal to x minus the sum over rho over rho root of x to the rho over rho, plus garbage we can get crap. We've got about it. So um, we'll talk a lot about that sum. X is going to be the main term, or rather, if the prime number theorem is true, then X is the main term. Because remember, the prime number theorem is just a statement of psi of X, and X are pretty much the same thing, like the relative error between them goes to zero. So it really just means that this thing, if the order of this thing, it's small compared to X. You know, if X gets large, we just forget about that. In percentage terms, it's very small compared to that. If you can show that, you can prove the prime number. So this sum is a sum over the non-trivial zero of the zero function. Uh, let's talk about what we mean by that. Now nah, I don't know what you're saying um, Okay. This is all the stuff you're allowed to put into the Riemann zeta function. You can put in complex numbers. Um, some stuff, it has some zeros. There's some numbers you can put into it, but it'll just spit out zero. It has these, it has zero that negative two, negative four, negative six, and so on. We call them the trivial zero. Right, they're, okay, they're not interesting. You can you work them out after a while. What happens? It's zero, zero. What's um, you have this pole at s equal to one. All of the other zeros, it turns out, lie in this string, this critical string. So the real part of s is between zero and one. And in fact, as you start to do some, it's like you start to look at the function and do a bit of analysis. Um, they all seem to be on this line. All of these non-trivial zeros seem to have a real part of one half. Um, and this has been confirmed for a lot of them. The Riemann hypothesis is, is exactly the same, that all of those non-trivial zeros have a real part of a half. And it turns out, like, it has, why does it have ramifications for the primes? If all the zeros have a real part of a half, or the non-trivial zeros have a real part of a half, um, you can sort of basically pull out that x to the rho out the front. And when you bound it, x to the rho, the size of it's going to mostly be dictated by the real part. So you, when you pull out x to the rho, you'll actually pull out x to the half if the Riemann hypothesis is true. And then you'll get a sum of one on rho. You can, you can sort of deal with that separately. It's a bit tricky. But if the Riemann hypothesis is true, you'll get like an x to the half come out of that sum, and the remaining stuff can be bound by like log squared x or something like that. So you get a pretty tight little error term by just typing in a bit of stuff. From where we stand here, with this explicit formula, there is so much mathematics you can do using this. Like, 
uh, maybe six papers that are all just start with this thing, twist it in a funny way, take us in a new combination of it and do these things. But there is a lot you can do with this thing. First thing we can do is prove the quantum theorem. Um, Bruce, is it okay if I go to 205 for the call just to make up for some of the technical issues? Cool. Um, okay. So let's have a look at what the sum actually looks like. So we know that it's a sum over these zeros. Interestingly enough, when zeros occur in conjugate pairs, there's a reflection about this real act. So whenever, so let's look at what a zero does when you put into the sum. Or rather, I'll take a pair of, I'll take a conjugate pair of zeros and I'll stick them in there and we'll see what happens. Well, what happens, well, axis out of the way, um, you get a, so you get a term like that, and then you go ahead and draw all the algebra, the imaginary parts cancel, and what you get is like this way, okay? So a pair of conjugate zeros in the Raymond zeta function, they contribute this waveform into that sum. Uh, I guess it's like a musical note, if you like. Uh, starts off quiet and high frequency, and then loud and low frequency. It's like a whale, right? Is that how I was now? I think. Um, so every okay, so that first pair of zeros makes a note. You can do, you can do the math. The next pair of zeros makes a note. The next pair of zeros makes a note. So every zero of the Riemann zeta function, and of course it's conjugate pair. I'm just doing arrows across the nose, but like you do need the conjugate pair to get that can that cancels out the imaginary stuff. You get a note. And as you, so you get infinitely many notes, and it turns out that so as you put them into the sum, as you play all these notes together, and you're just playing this ridiculously massive um, Riemann zeta zero chord, um, you resolve the structure of the, of the primes perfectly. Because phi of x is a funky long staircase, it's not equal to x, but you start with x and you can cut away those notes and you end up resolving original thing. So I'll uh, just show you what I mean. And the animation will be funny here because of the issues that I've had. But um, if you just start with X and then you start adding in like these notes on top, you'll get a little bit of structure. And then every additional note or the more, every time you find a zero of the random zeta function, you can plug it in and you're resolving more and more the structure at the moment, resolving more and more the structure of this loggy prime staircase. The standard approach in number theory, in analytic number theory, is to like take everything we know about the zeros, chuck it in the explicit formula, and uh, see if we can discover some stuff about the primes. So, I guess the question is what do we actually know about the primes? The primes, the zeros. What do we know about the zeros? We know that all of these non trivial ones are in the critical strip. That's when you're studying the Riemann zeta function, that's one of the first things you can prove. It's not too crazy. To prove the prime number theorem, right, we just need to prove that um, that sum there is less than x, is nothing compared to x. We can sort of do that just by showing, right? That the zeros can't be on the edge of the strip. If you can knock off the equality part of that inequality, that's the prime number zero. Because then that x to the row can't be as big as like x to the prime. Essentially, I can do the maths, you down some stuff, you won't be able to get it. So then automatically you show that that sum is not going to be as big as that matrix. All you really need to do is the prime number zero. Um, you just got to say there's no zeros there. What else can we do? Well, after a, bit of, a lot of work, we can show that not only can the real, does the real part of a zero have to be less than one, it has to be less than one minus another tiny little bit. Um, so that's called a zero free ring. Just sort of shaving off some rules, showing that you know you can't actually get too close to a line. Not only can you not be on that line, you can't be too close to a line. There's also things called zero density estimates where you can show, hey, there's not if there are zeros near that, you know, near the edge of the strip, there can't be too many of them. And then there's also like direct like numerical verification. So for example, there's this result in 2020 
the lowest 12 trillion zero are all on that line. So if you go up and you, you get your critical strip and you start going through the zeros, that makes that easier to fit. You can check that they're on that line, and it turns out that the first 12 trillion of them are at least. No one's ever found a counterexample to a random hypothesis. Um, actually, this result is um, Tim Trudgeon and Dave Platt. So Tim Trudgeon's at USW Canberra, uh, and Dave Platt's at the University of Bristol, and they have this result. Um, they've now been able to verify the random hypothesis to a, a height greater than anyone else. So you should start chucking all this stuff in. So, for example, for my stuff of time to train cubes, I literally looked at like this Chevy Chevy side function and I looked at is there a step between n cubed and n plus one cubed? And of course, it could be like a prime power step, but it turns out that they're very small, right? Because they're generated by a smaller prime. It's very easy to account for those prime powers. So, really, I started with this Chevy Chev, um, literally started with that explicit formula. Then just looking at the difference over between n cubed and n plus one cubed. And then I just, I mean, this is just subbing it into the explicit formula. Um, I get some sort of main term where I evaluate that. I just put this stuff in the sum together, small stuff and small stuff, and small stuff that I don't care about. I still got to, I still got to measure, I still got to keep track of it. Um, and you can estimate this using all that information I sort of talked about in the previous page, and you can get, you can prove, and, and then obviously you count the prime powers as well. Um, but you can prove that the thing is greater than zero, or rather that this is bigger than like this and the small stuff. And that's pretty much once you count the prime powers. The proof. I mean, it, it sounds simpler than it is, but that's the, the guts of it. It's maybe like um, 20 odd pages. There are, but yeah, I mean, like using basic ideas like this, you can do, I mean, you can come up with new stuff in number theory. Um, I had a paper before this, which was um, where I started with the explicit formula, and I just assumed that the random hypothesis is true. We do this in a lot of papers. We just assume that it's true and see what we can get. So what I was able to do was I was able to come up with the best interval, like the shortest, the smallest interval where there would definitely be a prime. Not as good as Legendre's conjecture, but close. Um, and that was just very simple eight page paper. Anyone in this room, now that you've seen the explicit formula, if you started with that as a starting point, you're happy with the proof. If you, you know, if you take, if you take that, um, you can follow the details in that paper. It's, it's called On the Riemann Hypothesis and the Difference Between Primes. It's, it's, I think it's very understandable. Um, yeah, I guess I should answer this question and then I'll finish. How do prime numbers help you get a job? Everyone asks, oh, do prime numbers help you uh, at Opera? Um, well, that's my brain. That's the part that's prime numbers and maths. That's the part that's options trading. That's the part that does things that are important. Uh, so uh, I just want to like make this point that, again that I said at the beginning of the talk that maths really lets you go anywhere you want. So like, even when you're like studying with prime numbers, there's a repeated application of fundamental like ideas. I'm using stuff in calculus over and over again. Again, um, I'm using like, uh, I'm getting a good feel for it as I go. So it solidifies your foundation. Like doing research, even if it's like research on something really abstract, the mathematical thinking you do gets solidified over and over and over again. You're always looking at using fundamentals and applying them in new and different ways. So you understand those fundamental theory better. Because that understanding, you also become like a very good communicator. There's one thing that we have a shortage of in maths community is communicators. We always need more people to talk about maths. And if you can do maths and talk about that maths to non mathematicians in like an industry workplace, you'll, you'll go far. Because um, we have a lot of mathematicians in the industry that are just not great at talking about it. I also focus on like explicit estimates for like getting actual numbers out of the stuff. And to do that, there was like all this, you know, like estimates like this. So like, I was very good at like doing Taylor series and stuff in my head fairly quickly. So I knew I had estimates like that. And then when I was like trading options, um, you know, we did like straddle. So if I need to know like uh, a straddle is like an instrument, price is given to by some formula. Uh, if I want to know how much the straddle changes price in like a day, I can just do like t, the t plus one form minus the t form, isolate everything out. 
And then I'd get something, I'd be like, oh, square root of one plus blah, oh, yeah, I've got a, you know, I've got an approximation for that. So I found that in options trading, a lot of the um, estimates and stuff I'd work with the number theory and just the math in general would just like pop up. So themes just pop up over and over again. Um, doing anything mathematical to our level makes you more employable and more further away. Um, so a job is like a thing that maps your maps for of dollars. And if you want to know more about getting that job, there's a guide on the AMSI website that you can, that you can go and download. Um, there's a summary there, but I'm just going to kind of photo it for on um, my blog. So you can go to the blog and go to resources and download the get a maps job guide. You're welcome to have a look at my PhD thesis if you want to read about prime numbers. Um, the introductory chapter just talks a lot about the statistical formula and how you can use it. Um, and uh, if you want to read it up to that, you can also go and look at that as well. Um, but yeah, that's sorry about the, the technical issues. Um, yeah, a uh, computer is still fixing it well, um, so it's good that we made the change. Um, yeah, sorry that was a bit much towards the end, but uh, yeah, thanks everybody for listening, and I'll be around for some. I'm happy to answer some questions as well.